Hello, I'm Jay Shadler. There is no more striking symbol of our nation's criminal justice system than the judge sitting high above the courtroom. We empower judges to ensure that proceedings go forth in accordance with the law. We also expect that they will behave in a manner that befits their office. And we feel wronged when that trust has been betrayed. As our first story from 1996 explores, judicial misdeeds can sometimes come on a grand scale. Just east of the banks of the Mississippi River, 80 miles north of Memphis, sits Dyersburg, Tennessee. Population, 18,000. People here call Dyersburg a friendly place, where folks take the time to stop and say hello. On the surface, it looks like a little sleepy town. It's quiet, nice, and pleasant. And then you uh, pull up the rug and look underneath it, and you find a lot of dirt. I just never dreamed anything like this would happen to our town. For years, the county courthouse here in Dyersburg has stood in the center of town, a rock-solid symbol of the power of law and order. But now this courthouse has become the center of controversy, splitting this community into a bitter debate. Were these always halls of justice, or were they once the scene of a series of shocking and awful crimes? The man who presided here was Judge David Lanier, a powerful and respected public figure. He'd been mayor 14 years, judge for eight. He and his wife raised two daughters, were regular churchgoers. Everyone knew he never drank, smoked, or swore. But a number of Dyersburg women say there was a darker side to Judge David Lanier. He came out from behind his desk. As I was standing up, he pinned me into my chair. I was standing, trying to get loose, pushing him, shoving him, trying to get loose. Sandy Sanders worked for Judge Lanier in the county juvenile office. She says he assaulted her three times in the courthouse, grabbing her breast, her buttocks, and in this case, kissing her on the lips. You feel like a judge, you're supposed to feel safe when you're around someone like that. And what he had done... Made me angry, very angry. This would be where the clerk would sit and where I was sitting that day. Patty Wallace worked as deputy clerk for another judge. When her boss was absent one day, she wound up behind the bench next to Judge Lanier. He rolled his chair over close to mine and he patted me on the knee and he said, uh, it's okay, I'm the judge. They expect us to sit close together. I can do what I want to. And... Uh, so I continued to call the cases. He proceeded to continue to pat me on the leg, and the more cases I called, the further he moved his hand up my leg until he uh, eventually had his hand between my legs. And uh, this was an open court. Mm -hmm. The women say the judge was even more brazen in his chambers. So he gets up from behind his desk, and the minute he got up, he unzipped his pants and took his penis out. Ruby Sipes had he known David Lanier for more than 30 years. She came to see him to discuss her divorce ruling. He kept reaching for my hands, saying, touch me, feel me, put your mouth on me. As long as I have known you, I've always wanted you to do this. And I kept doing like this. I said, David, please, no, I'm sorry. I cannot do what you're asking me to do. I cannot. Do you believe that Judge Lanier thought he could get away with all this? Absolutely. Uh, Ed Bryant, U.S. Congressman, was then U.S. Attorney in Western Tennessee. Uh, uh, but for the federal involvement, he would have. Judge Lanier's family had controlled politics in Dyersburg for 50 years. His father had been the county's political boss. His older brother was the local district attorney. If any woman wanted to file charges, she would have had to go to him. Because of the judge's power, the women say none of them complained officially. So the state did nothing. But an FBI agent heard rumors about what was going on in the courthouse and began an investigation. One of the most shocking stories he heard came from Vivian Forsyth. I had no clue 
that that's what I was walking into. I thought I was going to a job interview. Vivian went to Judge Lanier's office to apply for a secretarial position. She'd been recently divorced, and he had signed the papers giving her custody of her young daughter. But she says he threatened to take that custody away. Well, I reached out to shake his hand, and as I reached over the desk to shake his hand, he shook my hand, but he wouldn't let go. I started resisting and trying to pull away. He shoved me into that chair and then stood in front of me, straddling me, one knee on one edge of the chair and one knee on the other edge of the chair so that I couldn't stand up. And at the same time, he was holding me around the neck and then holding me on the jaws and kept pinching and pinching, trying to get my mouth open. So she says he physically pried her mouth open and forced her to perform oral sex. After it happened, what did he do? <laughs> he just laughed at me. And he walked and he sat back down in his chair. And I ran to the bathroom to wash my mouth out. And as I ran back past him, he sat there with a $100 bill and said, here for your troubles. You come back. You hear me? You come back next week. And there were others. Two of the judge's secretaries, a public housing official, a city hall employee. All say they were grabbed, molested, assaulted by the judge in his judicial chambers. Federal prosecutors indicted Lanier under the same law used to convict the police officers who beat Rodney King. It's an old civil rights statute, making it a crime for government officials to use their authority to violate a person's constitutional rights. It's what the federal authorities have for years, for decades, used uh, against state and local officials who abuse their official duties, their official powers. David Lanier was tried in federal court in Memphis in December of 1992. The jury acquitted him of some charges, including Patty Wallace's, but they found him guilty of assaults on Vivian Forsyth, Sandy Sanders, and three other women. The presiding judge said society had, quote, the right to be repulsed at the conduct that was proved in this case. In February 1993, David Lanier began to serve his 25-year prison term. When the Justice Files returns, meet David Lanier himself as he battles to get out of prison. For Judge David Lanier, the beginning of his incarceration meant that he started using his legal training to get himself out of prison. To do so, he constructed theories about why a group of women had come forward to make similar accusations about his behavior. The challenge for the rest of us was to separate fact from fiction in Lanier's story. Are you guilty of any of the crimes for which you were convicted or of which you were accused? No, ma'am. I am not guilty of any crimes at all. I have not committed any crimes. Why should people believe you and not the women? Well, I don't know that uh, I can convince anybody to believe me. I'm just telling you the truth. Uh, that's all I want on TV is the truth, and that's all I've told the whole time. But it never has been put on there, and I have my doubts whether you put this on there, but I'm going to say it anyway. David Lanier says he's the victim of a vast and elaborate conspiracy. Local political enemies, the FBI, and he says U.S. Attorney Ed Bryant, all plotted to put him behind bars. He was vindictive because I didn't support him for Congress, and I ruled against him in a case that he thought was a pretty big case. And he got appointed U.S. Attorney after that and told my lawyers, I'm going to prosecute him personally and see him in prison. Did you try to put David Lanier in prison because he didn't support you in a political race? No, I did not. If I had wanted to prosecute everybody that voted against me in that election, I would still be prosecuting. I would, yeah, I've got about 80,000 more people to do. Forgive me for keep being skeptical, but what you're saying is that everybody in the federal government involved in this all the witnesses against you, all, everybody knew what they were saying was wrong and was a lie, but they said it anyway just to get you. Is that it, what you believe? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. But then they testified in open court. Are you saying they, you they, saying they lied in open court? Exactly. The that's women all lied? Exactly. Th that's ridiculous. How, why would I make up a lie like this? It's the truth. And it's a truth, unfortunately, he can't face yet because he's still too sick. Lanier says the women were forced to lie by the FBI. He told us he always had good relationships with women. My position, maybe they thought I had money 
uh, power, influence, whatever, seemed to make women more friendly to me. And I don't have to tell you, David got a bum bum rap. Despite his conviction, Lanier still has some devoted supporters in Dyersburg. Do you think none of those women was telling the truth? I'm not saying that. But you know, you can always stretch the truth. They found those women that were mad at me and they paid them money. They paid them thousands and thousands of dollars to testify against me. Had do you have sex proof of that? Them. Yeah, I have proof of that. You do? Sure do. When we asked him to show us that proof, kind of proof, he said only that the women had told him so. He says that you all said the things you said because the government paid you thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. I'm sorry, you couldn't pay me enough money to get up and say something like that if it wasn't. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say something if it wasn't true. We have no. lost a lot of our life, and money's not worth that. These were women talking about things that were degrading to them, that were very intimate. Why in the world would anybody willingly say these things if they weren't true? They, they program them. They can get them to say anything they want them to say, and they did. These are very heavy accusations you're making. It's heavy stuff. We live in a police state. Keep in mind that Judge Lanier is a, is a lawyer who uh, perhaps was in jail with not too much, too much to do. And all he's got to do is sit there and think about ways he can blame other people, trying to figure out ways to get out. One of those ways worked. To the astonishment and outrage of his victims, this man convicted of turning his public office into a sexual crime scene walked out of prison just over two years into his 25-year sentence. We feel like it's a miracle that I'm out of prison, that I have been vindicated totally. Lanier had petitioned the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati, arguing that he had been charged under the wrong law, that the conduct he'd been convicted of was not a federal offense. Incredibly, while considering the law, some of the appeals judges seemed to make light of the charges. Listen to this audio tape of the proceedings. If I assault a scalper for a ticket to the Reds game because I'm mad as hell he's trying to charge me $25 and I beat the hell out of him in front of the stadium, and because I'm a judge I'm guilty of a federal crime? No, absolutely not. If he walks down to the stadium in his robe, however it might be different. <laughs> when they compare oral rape to beating up a scalper who sells you a bad set of tickets, and then they laugh. That's disturbing. Louise Fitzgerald is a psychologist hired by the prosecution. One can't help but think that they must be so far away from the realities of what this actually was about, because otherwise you couldn't laugh. You just couldn't laugh. The judges of the Sixth Circuit ruled nine to six that the assaults David Lanier was convicted of had not violated the women's constitutional rights. That set him free. All I could do was cry. I was so upset. I was angry. I was mad. I wasn't angry at Lanier so much as I was the system at, this, at, the, at that point. When you're assaulted, sexually assaulted, it felt like I had been done that way again by the system. It was just all like, no big deal. It's no big deal that this happened to these women. But in yet they another know. turn, there may now be hope for the women. The Supreme Court of the United States has agreed to take the case. They will make the final ruling, which could put David Lanier back behind bars. Meanwhile, he's living at home in Dyersburg, where some folks still believe he really belongs back on the bench. David, I think y'all are wrong again, but... No, thank you, Daryl. I appreciate that. I'll sure I second I, I appreciate it. I will do that. Appreciate it. In March of 1997, the Supreme Court overturned the ruling that set Judge David Lanier free but did so in such a way that his case was referred back to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati. Pending that court's decision, he remained out of prison. of judicial misconduct almost always catch our attention, but few jurists have fallen from such a height as Saul Walkler, former Chief Justice of the New York State Court of Appeals. And rarely has the contrast been so starkly drawn as that between Walkler's reputation on the bench and the crimes committed in his personal life. The Honorable Saul Walkler.
Saul Walkler was the chief judge of the highest court in New York State, and there was talk of him as a possible U.S. Supreme Court justice, or perhaps the Republican nominee for governor. But Walkler's political career ended with his arrest in 1992 on charges that he blackmailed, threatened, and stalked his former lover. If there's one judge in the state to whom most of us would have sworn that could never happen, it would have been him. Judge Walkler, married for over 40 years and the father of four children, had been having an affair with Joy Silverman, a prominent Republican fundraiser. In 1991, Silverman broke off the romance. Soon afterward, the judge's criminal behavior began. He sent anonymous lewd greeting cards to her then 14-year-old daughter, threatened to kidnap the daughter, and threatened to distribute embarrassing photos of Silverman if she didn't pay him $20,000. Silverman, using her Republican connections, went to then-FBI Director William Sessions, who put agents on the case. This afternoon, agents of the FBI arrested Saul Walkler. Ten months later, Walkler entered familiar courts, only to stand on an unfamiliar side of the bench. He pled guilty to one count of sending harassing letters through the mail and was sentenced to 15 months in prison. The prosecuting attorney was careful to clearly state the significance of his successful case. It is a very important message for everybody to understand that there is nobody who is above the law, no one whose position places them up above the reach of those rules and regulations which govern the rest of us. Meet juries certain to test your faith in the system, next on The Justice Files. to believe that when a trial goes to the jury, that jury will act responsibly. Usually that's true, but jurors also break the rules more often than you might imagine. And when jury misconduct occurs, the legal system has all kinds of problems dealing with it. In fact, as this report from 1996 underscores, it can mean the difference between life and death. William Hand sat on Georgia's death row, just days away from execution. Ten years earlier, a jury convicted the former Marine of murdering a prostitute. Twelve jurors voted unanimously to send him to the electric chair. Or did they? I refuse to vote for death. I would not write death on a piece of paper. Gail Daniels was a member of the jury, which began deliberations the Friday before Mother's Day. The issue was more about getting out of the jury room before Mother's Day and in time for Mother's Day than deciding this man's fate. And You're serious? I'm, I'm serious. By the next day, all the jurors were united in favor of execution, except Daniels. I said, you all do what you have to do, but I will not vote for death penalty. And the rest of the jurors voted. And when everything was over, they said, OK, we're finished. The jury returned to the courtroom and announced its verdict. But the judge then polled each of the jurors. The judge asked if we freely and willingly gave the verdict. And I said, yes. But you hadn't. Right, I hadn't. I did not want to get in trouble, nor did I want to go back through the same thing. I just left from the room. So I was just willing to say yes. William Hans was sentenced to death by electrocution. Another juror, Patricia LeMay, backed up Daniel's story in an affidavit and added that some in the jury made racist comments. I specifically remember one white woman back in the hotel room stating the admitted he did it. He should fry. I have faith. I have faith that the truth went out. William Hans counted on the courts to stop his execution, but the statements from two jurors could not change his sentence. Georgia state rules say jurors cannot testify against their own verdict, even if it's a matter of life and death. Hans's lawyers appealed all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and lost. Hans was executed on March 31st, 1994. Gail Daniels says she can't understand why the system refused to correct her mistake. Justice was not served. He should not have been put to death. Despite the trust we put in jurors, the fact is they are not perfect. And when they break the rules, that's called juror misconduct. But the legal system is surprisingly arbitrary in how it deals with misconduct. Some small things that jurors do can overturn a verdict. While sometimes much more serious offenses are ignored.
There's jury misconduct in probably nine cases out of ten. Keith Roman is a Los Angeles private investigator who specializes in jury misconduct. Hired by lawyers for the losing side who hope to overturn a verdict. Roman says verdicts can be challenged based on behavior that seems more overzealous than evil. Such as jurors visiting crime scenes on their own. We're seeking outside help. Happened? Jurors have brought Bibles into the, into the deliberations and read eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth kind of stuff. I don't understand. Why is that misconduct if you bring in the Bible? Because the Bible isn't evidence. But some jurors' motives are more sinister. Consider what happened in Houston when millionaire insurance executive James Dawley began a bitter divorce trial with his wife Susan. Robert Pirro, the lawyer for the husband, says he started getting mysterious calls on his answering machine talking about chemicals and chess. When you first heard that, what did that mean to you? I believe one of our jurors was the one making the phone calls. For what purpose? Uh, obviously to solicit a bribe. The juror was a 39-year-old chemist. Hero had heard of lawyers trying to tamper with jurors, but never the other way around. Hero got in touch with prosecutor John Brooke. He thought he was too damn smart to get caught and he got caught. The judge declared a mistrial in the divorce case. The juror pleaded guilty to soliciting a bribe, but as a first-time offender, received only 10 years probation. Prosecutor Brooke thinks the punishment should have been tougher. I would have liked to have seen him go to jail for a while. The people who are involved in that lawsuit are counting on a fair either jury or judge to make a decision. They're not counting on someone who's been corrupted. If everything from bribes to Bibles can cause a mistrial, you may be surprised by the kinds of things that don't. It all depends on timing, whether the information comes out before or after the verdict. The reason is Federal Rule of Evidence 606B and similar state rules, which say that after a trial is over, a juror can't testify in court about what happened in the jury room, no matter how bad, unless it involves an outside influence. The idea is that there has to come an end to litigation. Georgetown law professor Paul Rothstein, an expert on rules of evidence, says the aim is to stop losing lawyers from harassing jurors in an effort to overturn verdicts. But the result, he says, is that some pretty strange behavior has been ruled off limits to scrutiny. Well, in a number of cases, uh, jurors have resorted to uh, games of chance to decide what to be done with a defendant. Flipped a coin, for example. Liter literally flipped a coin to decide guilty or not guilty. That's correct. If you want some sense of just how much trouble the judicial system has dealing with irresponsible jurors, consider a trial that took place here in Tampa, Florida. All sides agree it was a case of gross juror misconduct. The issue was, what should the courts do about it? I don't like those jurors, for certain. Anthony Tanner was a Florida developer who was accused of defrauding the government in a bid-fixing scheme. As the case was tried in this Tampa courtroom, Tanner's lawyer, David Best, says he noticed something odd about the jury. You look over and someone has his head down on his shoulder like this, with his eyes closed and doesn't move for 15 minutes. Not dozing off, sound asleep. Was there just one juror who fell asleep? Oh, no. We had three or four that slept every day, basically. I felt guilty. You know, I, I felt like that, that he needed a new trial with a, um, a better jury. Daniel Hardy was one of the jurors in the Tanner trial. His conscience was bothering him because he claimed many in the jury drank heavily during the trial. And they'd be drinking the wine and then we'd order us a pitcher of beer and then it progressed over the next week instead of getting one pitcher between the four of us would get two and then maybe if we felt like it would get three and then it progressed into the to come to find out that the other two guys were doing drugs. But wait, wait you, here you are on a jury and during the lunch break you're all drinking beer and some people are taking drugs? Yes sir. Hardy said that he saw two jurors smoke marijuana during lunch breaks and that another juror snorted cocaine. When Tanner heard about the jury that convicted him, he was angry. That's not right. That's not the American way. You know, everybody's entitled to a fair and impartial trial by their peers, and you certainly don't expect them to be drunk and, and high on drugs. Tanner's lawyer thought he could get the conviction overturned based on jury misconduct, especially when another juror backed up the story. Tanner's lawyers appealed the conviction, but ran right into Rule 606B. The jurors can't challenge their own verdict unless there's an outside influence. 
It finally went to the Supreme Court, which upheld the rule, stating, Drugs or alcohol voluntarily ingested by a juror seems no more an outside influence than a virus, poorly prepared food, or a lack of sleep. Richard Lazarus argued the case for the government. We are protecting the jury system uh, at the expense of an individual defendant in a particular case, and ultimately absolutely true uh, that one particular individual has to pay that price. And it was a price that was worth paying in terms of Anthony Tanner? For that one individual, it was not a, a price worth paying. Uh, but for the jury system as a whole, uh, it was. But Tanner says the price for protecting the jury system is too high if it means that the kind of misconduct he saw in his trial goes uncorrected. What did it cost Anthony Tanner? It cost Anthony Tanner probably a million dollars in my life. Well, those jurors were having a party. It's tough. Anthony Tanner's conviction was overturned on a technical issue, though he lost his home and business financing his appeal. And the juror who solicited a bribe in the Texas divorce case voluntarily entered counseling. As the O.J. Simpson trial reminded us, not even the highest profile cases are immune to problems with juries. The course of another much publicized case in California was profoundly altered by jury wrongdoing. It was the prosecution of Heidi Fleiss, the Hollywood madam. How does your client plead not guilty to all charges? It was like a scene out of a movie premiere. But the star of this media circus was Heidi Fleiss, brought to a Los Angeles criminal court to be arraigned on charges of drug possession and running a prostitution ring. Her alleged clients were reported to be among Hollywood's biggest names. Fleiss's attorney expressed confidence in the process. I have faith in the jury system. I think there's no reason why we can't get a neutral and fair and objective jury. Fleiss was found guilty by the jury and sentenced to three years in prison on the pandering charge. But jurors admitted in affidavits that they had violated their instructions while deliberating. Fleiss appealed for a new trial. These jurors voted not on the basis of the facts of this case. They violated this court's instructions by discussing penalty which constitutes the misconduct and the prejudice is that they voted based on the punishment. It would be a miscarriage of justice to deny this motion based on this tainted record, Your Honor. Thank you. Without minimizing the seriousness of the misconduct here, I find that it, there is no substantial likelihood that the misconduct prejudiced the defendant and the motion for the new trial is denied. Fleiss and her attorneys were outraged. We think that the jury misconduct issue is absolutely compelling. And with all due respect to the court, we respect her ruling. We think there is a good chance that a three-judge panel, in this case, may very well reverse this court on that issue. In May of 1996, the Second District Court of Appeal panel of judges heard Fleiss's case and overturned her pandering conviction, ruling that jurors had, in fact, engaged in vote swapping to avoid a hung jury. In 1997, Fleiss was in the Pleasanton Federal Facility in Northern California, having been convicted separately of income tax evasion. Next, the police seem to have done their job and the suspect has confessed, but the judge throws out the case. How's this possible? Coming up on The Justice Files. There are times when the criminal justice system appears to have done everything right. A suspected criminal is apprehended by the police, the DA has decided to prosecute the case, and it appears before the court with seemingly overwhelming evidence. Then the presiding judge abruptly throws the case out or dismisses crucial evidence. Our next report from 1996 asks why this happens. The answer seems to be a word well known in criminal justice, loophole. It's called Cocaine Lane, a stretch of Interstate 70 south of Salt Lake City, a popular route for drug traffickers hauling their goods east from Los Angeles. Why don't you step out in just a second? Here's Warren. one now. This drive. video from a camera mounted inside a squad car records an important arrest. 
You tell you what this is? The cocaine. The drugs, a weapon. The driver even pled guilty. But incredibly, he was later set free because of constitutional conflicts which have frustrated law enforcement to an all-time high. Constitutional amendments protect citizens from unfair police interrogations or searches of private property without a solid reason to believe a crime has occurred. These laws governing police conduct have been tightened by the courts as the result of excesses or abuses by police. Go to the curve! 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 But now police feel those laws are so stringent, they are full of loopholes for criminals. Sort of like a get-out-of-jail-free car. You don't come off this car, okay? That Utah drug bust was a classic example. The officer pulled the car over because it had no license plate. But the judge ruled that the minute the officer noticed there was a valid temporary sticker in the rear window, he should have let the man go. The search, which came later, thus violated the driver's constitutional rights. The law, the technicalities, the loopholes. Frustration reached the boiling point in New York with the Carol Bayless case, which seemed to make a mockery of the entire judicial system. Bayless was a drug courier, caught red-handed with 80 pounds of cocaine and heroin, four million dollars worth. What's more, she confessed on videotape. What was, what was in the, uh, in the bags? Heroin and cocaine. And did you know that at the time? I didn't know it was heroin, but I knew it was cocaine. Ramon Pagan is Bayless's attorney. So they got a statement. They got a statement, they got they addresses. Gave great detail. Absolutely. And you don't challenge the accuracy necessarily of that statement. Correct. In her own words, Bayless told of her role in a multi-million dollar drug running scheme. With the admissions that she made, she would have been facing life terms. Federal Judge Harold Baer decided none of it, not the videotape confession, not the 80 pounds of illegal drugs, could be used against Carol Bayless at trial. Why? Because the judge said under the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, Police didn't have reasonable suspicion. In other words, no good cause for stopping her car. An outrageous decision from $4 million. New Yorkers were stunned. The decision is mind-boggling and impossible to understand. It's just crazy. Absolutely crazy. The street cops involved can't talk about an ongoing case, but their superiors can. Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Here's what happened. Police officers saw a car with out-of-state plates at 5 o'clock in the morning driving through one of the highest drug areas in the city, actually one of the highest drug areas in the United States or in the world. Police say they saw Bayless driving slowly on this street in a car with Michigan plates. She double parked and waited. Police watched as four men came toward the car from across the street carrying large black duffel bags. And then they see the trunk of the car open and they see two duffel bags put in the trunk of the car and then the trunk closes and the car drives away. That's a drug deal. You don't need a genius to figure that out. With all that, you might think the officers had reason to suspect a drug deal, but they told the judge they had even more. When police caught up with the men at this corner, they said at least one took off running and the other split up, walking quickly away. To the cops, they looked and acted suspicious, but not to the judge. Carol Bayless didn't say anything about the men running. So the judge chose to believe her. And then Judge Bear added his opinion that residents in this neighborhood tended to regard police as corrupt, abusive, and violent. So, by Judge Bear's logic, had the men not run when the cops began to stare at them, it would have been unusual. It was a defense lawyer's windfall. He said, even if I believe you, under your set of facts, you didn't have reasonable suspicion to stop her. She wasn't involved in anything. You actually didn't see criminal activity. I think in this case, it's a clear-cut uh, coddling of a criminal. The fact that he would take that she is a more credible person than my police officer, I think is outrageous. Ask the American public what they think about this one. Veteran detective Jerry Giorgio has worked the tough streets of Upper Manhattan for years. He says Judge Bear's decision was simply naive that for those who really know the neighborhood, the facts in the Bayless case speak for themselves. I think to any person with the key word here is with common sense would know what was occurring at that time. The value of the police 
following the Constitution is more important than the individual who may be released. I think what frightens us about all of this is that the result seems to be an improper one. Judge Rothwax has followed this case and countless others during 20 years on the bench. All right, let's call the next case. He knows all cops aren't angels. Indeed, police corruption has plagued New York City, often with illegal searches and officers lying in court to prop up bad cases. Fourth Amendment protection is a vital safeguard for basic civil rights. But over the years, constant legal challenges have resulted in a maze of confusing decisions. The judge believes this vital issue has reached a hopeless point. The police don't know the search and seizure law. The judges don't know the search and seizure law. Nobody knows the search and seizure law. The standard text on search and seizure in the United States today is close to 4,000 pages long. I would submit that if a chief judge was riding in a police car with a police officer, he could not with confidence guide that police officer in the task that he performs. Why have a court system? It's police arrest take the people to jail, whatever they charge you. Cops lie and are corrupt. And there'd be no way of checking that. Uh, it, they, their word would be absolute. Judge Rothrax is, I think, demonstrating what many people know, that the criminal justice system, at least in New York and in, the, in New York state courts, has become a board game. It's like a game of uh, guess it right or guess it wrong, and if you guess it wrong, the criminal goes free, as opposed to a real search for the truth and a system of justice. Coming up on the Justice Files, ideas for fixing the criminal justice system and people who have taken the law into their own hands. In April of 1996, after criticism from both the U.S. Congress and the White House, Judge Harold Baer reversed his initial ruling and allowed the 80 pounds of cocaine and heroin to be used as evidence against Carol Bayless. By 1997, Bayless had pled guilty to conspiracy for transporting drugs. <music> Frustration over continuing loopholes has compelled some members of the legal community to take action. New York Supreme Court Judge Harold Rothwax laid out his proposals for reforming the criminal justice system in his book, Guilty, The Collapse of Criminal Justice. Of paramount importance to Rothwax is the exclusionary rule, which disqualifies any evidence the court deems part of an illegal arrest. I think these exclusionary rules not only allow seriously guilty and often violent people to go free without good reason, but they also change the whole nature of the process. We're focused on what we ought to keep out of evidence rather than what we ought to allow into evidence. I've tried to argue that one way to simplify the law of search and seizure, which as I've indicated even the U.S. Supreme Court has conceded is intolerably confusing, would be to say that no evidence should ever be excluded where a police officer acts with objective reasonableness and subjective good faith. The fact that about one-third of the people arrested for violent crime are on probation, parole, or pretrial release adds another dimension to the judge's frustration with the workings of the current system. According to Rothwax, revolving door justice has become a reality nationwide. It is for you, the jury, to determine whether such intent existed in this case. We don't have truth in sentencing. That's one of the problems. So a person may be sentenced uh, to five to 15 years and uh, that means he's eligible for parole after he has served the five-year time, sometimes even earlier than that. The majority of states in 1997 often allowed convicted violent criminals to go free after serving a fraction of their sentences. Rothwax does credit New York as a leader in a group of states that requires serious offenders to serve over 80 percent of their sentences. Even so, the judge continues to criticize the logic of a system he is part of, but wants to improve. This is insane. All it is is a mass of technicalities and complexities that defy our ability to reasonably, fairly, uh, proficiently uh, prosecute people accused of crime. Some Americans have become convinced that the U.S. government has betrayed and even abandoned the Constitution upon which the nation was built. 
In response, they have created courts that administer their own form of justice outside the recognized legal system. There is a tendency on the part of people who uh, feel they have been dealt a bad hand by the established system uh, to say we don't recognize your established system anymore. We have this alternative system where we're the bosses, we're on top. Organizers claim that their courts are constitutional and that much of what state and federal governments do is not. Common law courts issue their own rulings, even arrest warrants, which are ignored at the recipient's peril. Some declare individuals free men, not subject to state or federal law. There are people who don't believe they have to pay taxes, don't have to have license plates, driver's licenses, and don't have to abide by a lot of the rules of society. Authorities say common law courts are not valid, but some have had an impact on real courts and government agencies by filing a blizzard of paperwork including hundreds of millions of dollars worth of phony liens, claims against property belonging to public officials. In the rush of business, such claims are often treated like the real thing by county clerks and filed into the record. That's when the problems can start for officials named in the liens. Colorado District Judge William Dressel had to go to federal court to get a lien against his property removed. But that was not the end of the harassment he faced. About a couple weeks after uh, that order was issued, I got, a, got another call and said, uh, you won't believe what's happened now. And I said, what? They said, they just put you in bankruptcy. In some counties, those filing liens against police and judges are being prosecuted on charges of attempting to improperly influence public officials. It does sound like uh, while there is some range for private activity here, uh, that as it goes too far, it is trenching on the established law uh, of the people of the country as accepted by the people of the country and as declared by the courts of the country. Just how disorderly is our legal system? Here's Professor Arthur Miller. I'm proud to say that the United States has the best justice system on the planet, but it's a system that works best when the public has confidence in all the different players, judges, law enforcement, prosecutors, and juries. Sadly, today that confidence is at an all-time low. Criminal justice's image has been buffeted by fear about public safety and by the wide exposure that the system's worst warts and bumps get on the evening news. People often forget that the critical activities in the justice system are all carried on by flesh and blood men and women. Judges, jurors, lawyers, and the accused, as well as the witnesses, bring all their human frailties into the courtroom. But let's not forget, these same individuals also bring with them all the strengths and humanity that have made this country thrive. We can only hope that after people acknowledge their faults, they can then celebrate the marvel that is our very own brand of justice. I'm Jay Shadler. Thanks for being with us. Join us again as we look behind the headlines at crime, punishment, and the law on the next edition of Justice.